really the person who's at all the person who's primarily responsible for this work. I'm standing in for Paulo Barbosa, uh, my colleague from Ileus uh, Bahia State, Brazil, who uh, conducted the, the survey. And uh, he did a postdoc with me for uh, a couple of years at, when I was at the University of New Mexico, uh, which coincided with his completion of data collection for this study, and I worked with him on the, the cleaning of the data and putting it together for, for analysis, and we're just getting to the point of really being able to present the results. We also did some other work with um, the uh, Santa Fe Nucleo, which is Jeffrey Bronfman's home uh, nucleo of, of UDV in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and that, th those were some neuropsychological studies which have been published, but I won't be talking about today. So this is probably not going to take the, the full time, but um, I'll just walk you through uh, the findings that we have so far, which are simple, but I, actually I think quite impressive and, and useful information in terms of overall uh, safety and benefits of uh, uh, WASCA use in the context of UDV. So I hope I hit the right. No, I got the wrong thing. Okay, sorry. Um, so will this just... I can go to Google Slides. I'm just afraid I'm going to have some of the problems that we had before. Do you want to keep giving a talk and I'll see what I can do with that? Okay. So is there anyone here who doesn't know uh, about the UDV and who they are and what they are? I, I, I figured the majority would, but a few people don't. So uh, UDV is the Uniando Vegetal, which is the, uh, one of the large uh, syncretic uh, ayahuasca-using churches that's uh, technically usually considered to be a uh, Christian spiritist church incorporating uh, elements of Orthodox Christianity and uh, belief systems that derive from uh, indigenous uh, traditions. And uh, it's well established in Brazil and has, uh, is on a solid legal footing there and is uh, essentially uh, protected by a Supreme Court ruling in the United States. So it's also uh, they're able to practice uh, in an above-board way in the United States. Okay. Um, you know, actually, it'd be easier for me just so I can see them here, and, I, and I'll go through it. So this is a uh, this was a survey that uh, Paulo completed with a number of colleagues in Brazil, and um, the aims were to uh, get a large representative sample of the UDV membership and to uh, examine a, just a few very specific uh, aspects of, their, uh, of their, their health and quality of life. So one was um, their substance use in, in smaller studies that have been done uh, of UDV membership. The, uh, it's been uniformly noted that rates of uh, use of uh, alcohol, tobacco, and illicit drugs is, is very low among uh, active members of the, of the UDV. And so this was an effort to really quantify that and collect uh, some more definitive data about the, the, the magnitude of that effect and uh, to um, really get some good information about that. Second was uh, quality of life. And I'm not going to present those, but there were some sort of standard quality of life measures. And then the third is um, to answer some questions about whether and to what extent there are uh, problematic or non-problematic interactions between the WASCA brew and the uh, psychotropic medications that people might be taking. And it's a large enough sample that there were over 100 people who had experienced taking, um, participating in ceremonies while they were concurrently taking antidepressant medications, which in, if you read in the literature, that's something that, you know, there's a theor theoretical risk of dangerous interaction, serotonin syndrome, and things like that. And so uh, we haven't analyzed those data to this point. It's, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly not a lot of evidence that, there, th that bad interactions are common, but um, it's, it's something that we hope to quantify better and uh, find out uh, to what extent um, and how they mitigate those risks. Because it seems to be something that's just handled within the practice of the UDB and managed without uh, a lot of difficulty in general. So um, 
the, the other nice feature about this survey is that the, the measure that were used are the same measures that were used in some uh, uh, community surveys that have been done uh, across Brazil by the, the health authorities. And so we're able to compare the rates among the UDV membership with uh, general Brazilian population and also break that down by age group to look in, in some detail at the uh, rates of substance use. And then the other question was if, um, to what extent, I mean, we're looking at UDV members versus the general population in Brazil, but within the UDV group, uh, to what extent does their duration of participation in UDV and the intensity of their uh, current participation in terms of how many uh, ceremonies have they attended in the past year, to what extent does that also related to their uh, use of alcohol and drugs. So um, there's a little bit about the, the methodology. This is the, uh, the uh, instrument that I mentioned that was used to assess substance use. And this um, uses these criteria which approximate a diagnosis of uh, substance dependence. It's not, it's not exactly one of the formal diagnostic uh, interviews that people use, but it includes these six criteria. And uh, approximately, if you have more than one of these, if a person has more than one of these, then they're, they're likely to have a significant substance dependence problem. It's not exactly a diagnosis, but so the threshold is possibly a little bit lower. You'd be falsely including some people who maybe didn't have such a severe problem. But just take this as sort of a, a, um, a, a proxy for a diagnosis of substance dependence, and it's maybe a little bit more uh, uh, including some people who aren't quite, quite that severe. So the sample was uh, almost 2,000 people overall across 10 states in Brazil, uh, 36 churches, and this constitutes 12% uh, of the active uh, UDV population in Brazil. So that's a uh, pretty nice and fairly representative sample. Obviously, it's not exactly representative, but it covers uh, all areas of the country and a, a nice large number. So here are the comparisons with the um, uh, Brazilian norms. So this is lifetime use of alcohol. This is any use at all. So the question is, you know, have you used uh, alcohol any time in your life? And that it's not everyone that has done that. But interestingly, if you look in the, um, the older age group, so this is, the, this is the 25 to 34 year old group, and this is over 35, the lifetime use in the UDV uh, members, that's the blue bars, uh, actually was higher. So uh, over the whole course of their life, they were more likely to have used alcohol at some point. And the younger group uh, actually is lower, in the, the, the UDV group is, is lower, presumably because they, they were young when they joined the UDV and they never, um, never got around to trying alcohol. But overall, it's not that these people just never tried or were interested in alcohol. They, they, def they had that history. Uh, but if you look at current alcohol dependence based on those criteria that I showed you, you see this enormous difference between the UDV sample and the, the community norms. And that's across all of the age groups. So again, the blue is the UDV members. This is um, uh, just under 5% here in this youngest age group versus 19% in the, in the general population. And as you get older, that it gets lower and lower, 1% here uh, versus over 10% in the, in the Brazilian sample. And now if you exclude people who've been involved in the uh, UDV for less than a year, so they might have actually said, yes, I, you know, I have been dependent in the past year, but actually I wasn't a member of the UDV at that point. So excluding those people, which was about just about 6% of the sample, taking them out of the equation, you see the numbers drop even further. And so now we're down to 0.5% versus 10.4% in the older age group. And um, so these are really, I mean, some of the largest effects that you'd ever hope to see. It really is um, extremely striking. Moving to tobacco use. So this is lifetime use again. And the pattern is exactly the same. So lifetime use of tobacco was higher among the uh, older age groups, everyone older than age 24, and the younger age group, under 25, um, that was slightly lower in the UDV sample. And uh, again, if you look at the current dependence, these rates are 
uh, much lower by a factor of four or more in the, in the UDV sample. And again, taking out those people who had been UDV members for less than a year, again, the numbers drop even further. So, um, you know, I do clinical research and I, I, I'm not used to seeing graphs that, that look like this. It's usually, you know, about this much difference and that's pretty good. But this is just um, pretty remarkable. So this is a statistical model that uh, we did to look at the relationship between the UDV, uh, the intensity of people's involvement with UDV and uh, how likely they were to use substances. So it's a logistic regression, which means you're trying to predict is a person, uh, do they or do they not, in this case, have alcohol or tobacco dependence. And what this shows is that um, the odds ratio is the, is the measure of that association. So an odds ratio that's less than one is 0.6 here, for every year that you've been involved in the UDV, your odds of being alcohol dependent drop by, uh, you know, about a third, because that's just about a third. So, and that's, you know, highly significant and, and really a pretty large effect. And then interestingly, also, even after taking into account how long somebody's been engaged, also, how many ceremonies have you attended during the previous year, that also is a significant predictor. Predictor: The more ceremonies you've been to, the, the uh, less likely you are to uh, have uh, current alcohol dependence. And the pattern is, is exactly the same for tobacco dependence as well. So both the duration of involvement and the intensity of involvement. The um, sort of baseline, yeah, there's another fact, I don't know if people know this, but the typical uh, pattern of practice in the UDV is... Uh, that there are regular meetings that all members are expected to attend uh, two, uh, twice a month. And so that's kind of the base. And then people who are more advanced in the, in the hierarchy of the church are, uh, attend additional ceremonies and there's special ceremonies on special occasions. So that would be, if you're just a kind of regular entry level member, you'd be uh, doing you know, something like 25 sessions a, a year. And then, you know, it could be twice that in people who are very active. Uh, and, and then this is uh, just past year use. And uh, again, the, uh, the pattern is exactly the same. The more years you've been involved in UDV, the um, less likely you are to be using alcohol and the less likely you are to be using tobacco and, and uh, the more ceremonies you've attended in the past year, similarly, the less likely you are to be using the, the other drugs. So um, what I'm not showing you here because we just haven't uh, scrubbed the data is the, uh, the information on other drugs uh, of the, that people might be using, illicit drugs, which would include cannabis and cocaine and uh, those, those would be the main ones in Brazil, but you know, also other drugs and uh, hallucinogens too. And um, none of, uh, in, in each case, the, uh, the UDV folks are using substantially less than the uh, Brazilian norms. So really across the board, um, the uh, people's, there, there's a very strong negative association between substance, problematic uh, substance use or any substance use um, you know, other than the sacramental wasca, and uh, which they wouldn't consider a substance. I mean, it's a sacrament. So, uh, all forms of drug use decrease by um, you know a factor of five to ten, essentially, um, among people who are actively involved in in UDV. So, you know, that's interesting to me because my main main thing I do is clinical research, and I I'm doing you know currently. Uh, psilocybin assisted treatment of alcohol use disorder. Um, we've certainly looked at the possibility of uh, using uh, ayahuasca brews as well and there are some studies uh, beginning now in Brazil to, to look at just that. Um, we don't really know if there's something special about uh, ayahuasca and whether the, I mean somebody mentioned the importance of the the harmala alkaloids and there's a lot of reasons to think that the there could be anti-addictive effects uh, and other uh, uh, mood enhancing and uh, cognitively enhancing effects of the harmala 
alkaloids. Uh, and then there's the DMT, which one would expect to behave pretty similarly to, uh, to psilocybin that we're using in our current clinical trials. But that's, um, it's very intriguing and encouraging that these effects are that large. Now, the, the big caveat here is that there, there is a norm and expectation if you're a, a member in good standing of the UDV church, you're really not supposed to be using alcohol or drugs or smoking. So it's, it's not that they're just saying, you know, do whatever you want and, and people are just quitting. They are also uh, encouraged not to, not to use and they're actually can only rise to a certain point within the church if they continue to use alcohol. So there are certainly uh, social norms that play a part in this as well. And it's, there's no, probably no better way to disentangle those effects other than um, outside of the religious context and in, in uh, sort of more in clinical <coughs> studies. But um, in any case, this is uh, strong evidence that uh, for this particular benefit of involvement in the, in the UDV and uh, would be very interesting also to see if the findings are, how similar the findings would be in Santo Daime or Barquino or other uh, ayahuasca using groups. So um, that's uh, really about all I had. So plenty of time for questions and more time for the next speaker, I guess. <laughs>